there. So they introduced me as follows on the stage to the crew. Uh, guys, get ready. This is a complete wild man. He's carrying markers in his hands. Get ready. He has approval. Yes! So let me ask you, who of you is the founder of a company? Raise your hand, please. One, two, three, four, ah, plenty. Who of you is in sales? A little less. Okay, who of you is good at the art of making love? <laughs> two, three. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, what I'm going to talk to you about is the art of making love. Now, many of you will think to yourself, how does that have to do with sales? And there I go. First, I'm going to talk why we need it. I'm going to explain how you can do it, and then I'm going to explain to you what to do. But I want you to realize, to me, sales is like a technology. And that technology is ready for innovation. Far too long have we used the exact same sales model. Here's an example. Many of you get these emails in frequently, I assume. This is called email-based outbound. It is currently used by most sales organizations at startups. It won't work. This is the automation process, and the automation is considering personalization, meaning I'm using your name, your company, and your title to address you. What we see down here is emails with nothing but I, I, I. Won't work. Volume tactics are no longer of interest to sales organizations. Second thing. Social selling. Social selling is intended to cover that gap. However, although social selling is really good, it is often badly executed. In order to be really, really good at, at, at social selling, maybe 5% of your organization can do this. This means that it doesn't scale. Number three, as a result, your sales organization needs to generate leads in a form. They need to develop leads. And what do we see here? Ever since 2015, that email-based outreach is not generating enough leads to keep a sales organization afloat. For those of you founders, what this means is whatever you're being taught in books today, whatever you hear at conferences, we are currently working within a range of 100 to 200 companies. We work with 10 to 20 companies every month. This shit won't work anymore, okay? It has dropped down radically, like <laughs> airplane has gone out. Doesn't matter whether it flew upside down or not, that mountain has been crashed. Why is this? Because what we consider two-stage sales cycles are not universally applicable. What we see per today is that most companies believe in a two-stage sales cycle, where there's one inside sales organization, considered what they call an SDR, who calls up people, gets a meeting, and sets up the second person in the sales organization, the AE. But what we do is when you, we call it a two-stage sales cycle, that takes too much time, that takes too much money. So down here on the lower side, you see the triangle of death. That is where sales organizations go to die. If you're a founder and you find yourself in a triangle of death, Please get professional help in building your sales organization. That on the, on the horizontal axis, we see how many leads are needed per rep, and vertically, what is the sales price that you sell at. Left lower corner, get help. Next step. What we have seen across all these organizations is the following. That they have essentially become rainmaker immune. What does this mean? B2B sales organizations for the past 20, 30, 40 years were very reliant on what they call 2080 rule. Does anybody know what the 2080 rule means? Ma'am. 80%, thank you. 80% of the revenue is generated by 20% of the people. But that is based on a very high contract value. If you're selling quarter million dollar to a million dollar deals, you don't need a lot of people to close these deals. Therefore, 2080 applies. But hang on. Jocko, hang on, hang on and on. Why? Because in SaaS sales, we don't sell naturally at 250K price. We sell at 5K, 10K, 1K. We sell at $5 a month, $10 a month, $500 a month. We sell at all kinds of dollars a month. But what we're not selling is a million dollars a month, OK? And so what we see is that price dropped. That means that rainmakers cannot win enough deals to make up for the non-performers. That's depicted down here. They have become rainmaker immune. Now, the other 20% of the people, right, the 20% closed 80%. So what did the 80% do? They did the 20%. Now, guess what? That 80% now has to generate 80%. And that is a problem in sales. It is underlying methodology is that it doesn't work. Here's a message we send out 
to, uh, to a variety of VCs earlier this year, or late, late last year, and it tells you about this problem, and it says, like, look, we have seen that you're trying to solve this by moving your sales team to Arizona, to Denver. That won't fly. We've seen it, it won't fly. We've seen that you're trying to hire and fire. It doesn't work. It is not a people or a location problem. It is a way more deeper rooted problem underlying underneath. And that is that your sales methodology of selling customer stuff that you don't know if they really need is outdated by, what, say, maybe 10 years. And that is why we need that. We need to take a look at it differently, uh, from a different angle. Now, here's where I come in. The art of making love. Now, if we see here this picture, this is the model, this is the methodology that most sales organizations consider their, their foundation. Land and expand. Growing up in the early 2000s here in a sales organization, my CEO told me, Jocko, never confuse installing with selling. And what did he mean with that? You sell. Let somebody else take care of the installing. Why? Because we were money makers. Money came first. Land, get the money, and then expand. And today we see this as many of our customer su uh, success organizations. They look at like, I want, the I want to make love to my customers. I want them to be happy with me. I want them to love me. And that is the problem. If you look at these tasks that are currently used, these are tasks that are being trained on, they're being educated on, they're being implemented. These tasks are call, email, pitch, objection handling. Now guess what? If they're pitching, they're not listening. They're not talking to a customer. They're not asking the right question. So why are we teaching them pitch training? All these tasks that we have considered, the basic tasks of sales, are currently in question. In a modern sales world, should we still consider the patching? We know one thing, people don't want to be sold. I down here, this is an email I got a few days ago. I got this beautiful Hilton vacation for you. It's free or whatever it is, it's low cost. It's beautiful, everything included. Uh, I don't want to be sold, even if they're giving me this away. I don't want to be sold. I love whales, I love whales so much. I, would, I just love freaking whales, okay? I've watched whales, I love whales. I love to visit whales, see whales. In front of, on University Avenue, there's a group that is trying to save the whales. They make you sign stuff. I hate selling that they are selling to me so much that I actually cross the street to get to the Apple store three times to make sure I get to the Apple store without being confronted with somebody trying to sell me. People don't want to be sold. Now, if you go back and we say we need to build a more customer-centric uh, uh, perception, and here you have this, this quote previously done on big data, what is customer-centric? Can somebody please explain to me what customer-centric selling is? How will we do it? Where will we start? How would we really start approaching a customer in a way that when they are selling to me, I feel like I'm not being sold? Now, it is actually a lot easier than you think. Here's why. You see that heart? What if we got it all wrong? Now, what I'm about to show you next, I'm not going to try to convince you. I'm not here to sell you on this idea. I don't want you to walk away like, oh. I just want you to tinker with it. I want you to think what the impact on your business could be if you simply switched it around. What if our sales organization's objective is to make love to the customers us? And what if the customer success organization is really there to make revenue? Now, what would, how would that be? Now, let me tell you, it will be honest, you know, everyone, if you're in sales and you haven't had one customer love you over the past five to 10 years, then you probably you haven't been in sales. Sooner or later, even the worst salesperson in the world will find somebody to go like, oh, that person was the best salesperson I ever had, right? So as the, as, as the quote says down here, it is not a problem to make it once. But what is a problem is to do it again and again. Doing it again and again, now that is the art of making love. How do I get customers to love me so much that they keep buying from me? If we start thinking about how to make love, how would we do that? Now, here's the activities that you can take. First of all, let's take a look at that sales funnel in another way. What we see down here, we no longer see the land and expand. We're changing methodologies here. What if we consider it, instead of land, close and expand, what if we start thinking about educate the customer? Commit mutually to the future and assist them achieving that future. What would it be like? Here's what we found. It's based on six experiences. Ah! Ah! 
R, this is the first experience, customer experiences. They have a problem. R, I have a problem. No, they don't call me up in the morning and say, Jocko, I'm ready. I'm a qualified lead. Can you move me into an opportunity? They don't say that. At least I haven't ever had one, right? What they say is, R, I have a problem. The second thing that they say is, aha, I understand the solution. And the third thing that they say is like, wow, this sales organization that I just worked with, they really knew what they're talking about. They were experts. Boom, deployed on time, followed by, yeah, finally, this solution is working. It's given me the benefits. And finally, oh my gosh, why didn't I learn about this before? These are six experiences that your customer's thinking. This is the, the foundation of any successful SaaS organization, thinking in experiences that your customers are looking to have. Now, some people say to me, Jocko, you just, you just made the names different. That really doesn't make a difference. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Name it, what we're naming it makes a heck of a difference, okay? Consider spear phishing. ABM is currently considered spear phishing. Okay, let me ask you, um, we know who the fisher is, right? But are we seriously referring to our customer as the fish? Because I know what's going to end up with a fish here, right? He's going to be sushi on somebody's plate. So if I'm talking about spear phishing as the newest way of account-based marketing or as the newest way of marketing to a customer, I'm already from the get-go are starting to rethink or starting to think that this is not right. So it does matter what we call it. So let me figure out and give you a few new ways of looking at sales. Here's number one. Why don't we use all these terms that we have and start changing it a little bit? I don't want a meeting with a customer. Seriously, as a customer, I don't need a meeting, OK? So anybody that sends me a message, do you want a 50 meetings? No, no, hell no, OK? Meetings is not what we are there for. A good conversation is what we want to have. Conversation is the goal to get. I don't need you to pitch me. No sales organization needs to learn about the pitching. What they need to learn is to understand and diagnose a customer's problem. Now, in order to diagnose a problem, I need to know what, to ask, what kind of questions to ask. So why are we teaching sales organizations about the product and how to pitch it? Because I can tell you right now, if that conversation starts and they don't know what to say, they're going to start pitching about the product. Instead, what we need to teach sales organizations and salespeople how to ask the right question. Well, we found training, and I'm saying, when I say thousands of people, I'm underestimating what, the amount of people we've trained. We're talking about tens, maybe, you know, maybe close to 100,000 people that we've now trained. Very few people know how to catenate a closed-ended question followed by an open-ended question. The basic form of question. 99% of sales organizations do not know how to do that. That tells you there's a need for that. Second thing, I'm going to pick one more thing out down here. You see the word trade? We replace the word. We do not believe in negotiation. Negotiation is intending. If I'm going to sell you a $10 million service uh, of source, you know, like they have to break out the wall in a facility like this to put the computer in, then we can talk about negotiation because you're trying to get it from $10 million to $9 million. I get that. SaaS services were never intended to be discounted. There is no discount in SaaS service. It shouldn't be there. It doesn't exist. SaaS services have no discount. You have pricing structures. You may have two or three different pricings. I get that. No discount. Try to call up LinkedIn and try to negotiate your price with a LinkedIn person, right? It's not going to happen. No discounts. Not for a $5 service, not for a $50 service, not for a $25,000 a month service. No discounts. Instead, what we need to teach our salespeople how to trade. If I discount, value goes down. If I trade, I keep the value up. If I negotiate, I need to learn how to negotiation tactics. If I trade, I'm sending you in, into a meeting with what are you going to trade? The number one problem, absolute, yes, whiteboard. Can I write on this seriously? Number one, leads. Number one, all the time. Every time you trade, first thing you ask for, would you be so kind to introduce me to anybody else that could benefit from the service? If that is the number one problem, then let's tackle that straight away at the trade. We teach them, coach them. Go ahead, ask. Now, I'm not asking you, can you introduce me? I'm asking you very specifically, is there anyone else that can benefit from this service? Again, value-driven, mindset. When we start teaching these sales organizations this way, we see that, that change that is occurring. Trade. There's a number of other things which I encourage you to, to, to uh, one day to look at. But what we see down here to the left and to the right is the difference. On the left, we have a traditional sale where money is pursued. On the right, we have what love is pursued, the more customer-centric. Think about yourself. 
If you are buying right now a car, a house, I don't care, a SaaS service, what do you want your salesperson to do to you? Do you want to have on the left column or on the right? I know the answer already because we see it. The results we saw earlier on depicted that clearly. People don't want to be sold. They want to be educated, helped, assisted. All these other words are the better words. We just never em embrace that in our sales methodologies. What we see down here is a simple way on how to sell. What we find, and as I was describing back behind the stage on key advice, we believe in the concept of Tarker. Learn how to control your tone of voice. Tone of voice, not only by on the phone, in emoticons, in how you write your emails, in the way you use capitalization, preferably not. That is all using tone of voice. Second thing is learn how to ask questions. Question, question, questions. Do you have a list of questions to ask? And so on and so forth. Listening actively. For those of you founders who are currently recruiting salespeople, two things that we're looking for. Listen and take notes. If the sales candidate at the end of the meeting, you know, like you're wondering whether you should hire him or her, ask for, give five points of feedback and say, here's the five reasons why we're, we're, we're not ready to move forward. If they're not making notes, do you think they're going to take notes later on when the customer tells them there are five reasons why they're not going to move forward with your product? Probably not, right? And so the person sits there and then I says, okay, so um, that was the one reason that I gave you. Do you. Can you recall and tell me what the other four were? Oh, I forgot. Not hired. Okay? Now, if the person comes back and says, hey, here's the five, I really want to discuss with you the top two, and you're pretty much hired already, right? Because you learned how to listen, take notes, and you start to have a conversation with me. Elaborate and repeat what you heard are key skills that are needed to, uh, to, to, you, to be used in today's culture because most of the time we do not understand what the person actually has said. So whether we repeat the offer that the customer, counter offer that the customer made to us, repeat it. When the customer told you what the needs are, repeat it. Your doctor does it, your car mechanic does it. It would be appropriate for a sales professional to do it. Repeat what the customer said. All these things lead to this amazing amount of details that we need, okay? Here's what you see, what Ryan Mendes at Gainside does. He has written this all, this all this around his computer. Over time, this all will be, mon will be you know, like new technology will step in down here. But you see his questions that he has to ask, and which particular uh, uh, persona that he deals with, what question that he asks, the yellow post-it notes, is the augmented information that he will review. This is the kind of salesperson, inside salesperson, and the future salesperson we're looking at. The problem is we need to train them quick. We can't, and therefore, they need all these aids to help them. This works. Ryan has received numerous kind of recognition, including awards for his behavior. It works. What we see, the second thing is we need to create blueprints. And as you see down here, we have created the, all these different kind of blueprints in order to help these companies organize that. In this blueprint, you see little blueprint sentences where we help them start to kick off a sentence. Appreciate you taking the time for today's meeting. May I ask, we got you till the top of the hour. Does that still work for you? Great. Well, the outcome of today's meeting was to see if you're interested in moving forward with a demo. Is that fair? Yes. Well, let's get started. Simply doing that 20, 30 second opening will change most sales behavior because they're currently talking about the weather. God forbid they're talking about the Golden State Warriors to somebody in Cleveland, right? Oh, we had a great night last night. Dude, you can't talk about sports anymore. You can talk about politics. And when you live in California, you probably can't talk about the weather either, right? So why don't we talk what you should be talking about, get the meeting started, and for those people who are there, start asking a few questions. What well, we see that we need to also, today's generations, we cannot train any longer. Training is a complicated matter for them. So what we prefer is that we coach them. Down here you see coaching. The problem with training is that the current people who are doing currently being sales trained, their gap of knowledge is too big. And if I start training them, it becomes uncomfortable. The reason, because they're uncomfortable with the new, new materials that we train, makes them not want to train and implement it. So we need to create a new level of comfort, uncomfortness. What we do down here in this dark room, one call is being picked, and we put up that call, and we review it with the entire team. Now, that will make you uncomfortable if that's your call, and if you're not executing what we just practiced, and you know, when we stop the call and we say, finish the sentence, oh, you didn't take any notes, boo-boo. Finish the sentence, can you summarize what the customers say? That is creating a new level of uncomfort that they never had. That is called coaching, not training. 
That level, what you see, does not need to happen in person. What we see and demonstrate down here, this is the oddest thing in the world. I could not <laughs> Okay, I know you guys are gawking at me. The, the dude is high on something. Yes, and generally Red Bull and life. Those are the two things I love. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the, if I have a room full of trainees in them, let's say 20, the people in the back of the room, if they bring up the, lap uh, the, the, the laptop and they're looking at me on video, they rather look at me on video than they look at me standing in front of the classroom. It's just odd behavior. So what we have considered and what we found, that the nose-to-nose -nose distance is what matters. What we found is that when we start training online, that the nose-to-nose -nose difference between the teacher and the student is always the same. It democratizes the entire classroom. We essentially tell teams to not go huddle up in a room. They can if they want to, with, a central, with one central audio being on. We tell them, stay at your desk. Put your headset on, be there. We train you right, and then we unmute and mute who is need needed. That level has changed the way how we engage. You still see whiteboard. Whiteboard training is important, OK? Whiteboard training means that you control your, 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 your trade. OK, art of making love. As I wrap up, I want you to consider, and I want you to take away from this. Is there, is there time for a new innovation? When you build your product, which you spend years of developing, do you really want to trust it into an age-old system which primarily is sales loving money? I can tell you from our experience, and like I said uh, before, with over 200 customers' help right now, I can tell you that it has a high likelihood of not working. It's not never going to work, but it is very hard to make it work. What I believe is that if we start loving the customer as a sales organization, we can change the industry your product will be represented by passionate people. And what they are going to look like, they are going to believe that not only what we sell matters, but the way how we sell matters. And with that, I want to thank you, thank you for the opportunity of letting me share my passion with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>